Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's um, really, really awesome to be here today. <laughs> um, my story, I guess, starts as a really zealous 20-year-old in the middle of post-earthquake Haiti. We were in the middle of our first distribution of school supply kits. So we were on our way in these big people mover trucks, bulging with supplies to a rainforest enclosed school. And with a, a bit of a lurch, our trucks get, get bogged in the mud. So immediately we jettison personnel and supplies alike in an effort to, to free the vehicles. And from where we're standing, we can see the school like just on top of the hill. It, it's taunting us, challenging us almost. So we decide to go on foot. And as we're readying the supplies for the trek up the hill, a group of local mothers come down and surround us. I guess they're sort of observing the impending disaster that's now unfolding before their eyes. Now, me as a strapping young male, as an entrepreneur and as a leader, I pick up a box of supplies under each arm and start to plod up the hill. And these young mothers, these slight women, in one smooth movement, pick up three or four boxes, effortlessly place them on top of their heads, and then power up past me up the hill. <laughs> so I took a lot of things from this experience. Humility, for one. And the importance of a strong female presence in leadership teams. But what this experience and those that, will follow, that, and those that were to follow highlighted for me is that what and how we encourage young people to think about social innovation and entrepreneurship actually has the potential to undermine our ability to contribute and to undermine our thirst for making a difference. And this thirst is especially evident in the millennial generation. A global survey undertaken by one of the organizations that I'm involved in revealed that 84% of millennials believe that they have a duty to change the world for the better. A duty, not just a desire. And how this is manifesting itself in the 21st century is in the formation of small companies, startup enterprises that tackle commercial, technology, social challenges. A recent Deloitte report on the digital economy estimated that just over 10% of Australians are in the process of starting a new company. 10%. That's the highest number in recent history. And that number would only increase if you included not-for-profits and you know, informal organisations and societies. But the challenges that we face are indeed great, and the enterprises that are being formed are modest. We have a specific playbook for young entrepreneurs that I believe undermines the potential of the broader demographic to contribute by idolizing perfection and, and commercial success. So I would encourage young innovators, young thinkers, young entrepreneurs to modify this playbook in three ways. By changing the mindset that values innovation by increment, by embracing vulnerability, and by valuing the social. So my first challenge is to re-engineer the mindset that values innovation by increment, reasoning by analogy. So broadly for me, there are two types of innovation. There's supportive innovation and disruptive innovation. Supportive innovation generally considers existing structures, how to make them more efficient, more effective. Disruptive innovation takes one of those structures, breaks it down to little pieces, and then reassembles it in a way that it almost immediately renders previous iterations obsolete. And we have a tendency to box and push young thinkers into the former mindset, a supportive innovation mindset. And we actually do that for primarily two reasons. The first is to reduce the potential for bad ideas. Logically, if something is existing in one paradigm or structure, then we transfer it to another, albeit with a bit of tweaking. And secondly, we use it as a benchmark of potential success. It's all too common to see an entrepreneur or young thinker pitching for funding or support by justifying their creation by something that's already been built. I have built the Twitter for cats. And yes, I've seen that one. Or I'm building a new type of classroom for an underprivileged community. So <clears throat> and we're, we're really pushing young people into this mindset. So let's apply that mindset as an example to an area that I'm currently looking at early childhood education in developing nations. The challenge is, is that before the age of six, many children are already before, falling behind, even before they reach primary school. So applying a, a, a supportive innovation mindset, a, a reasoning by analogy, you can potentially identify that, well, in Australia, we have rigid sort of childcare daycare structures, 
and they have a low student-teacher ratio, and therefore children are hitting all their milestones, so that's great. And then you could identify the existing structure that's in place in a developing nation. Perhaps it lacks the resources to support such rigidity. And you could perhaps reason through to a solution that involves some form of a, a pop-up childcare centre, maybe staffed by local parents that needs less resources. And that would likely be valuable, but it's supportive innovation. So let's try applying more of a disruptive mindset, a reasoning from fundamentals mindset to a related industry, the resourcing of primary schools. So in Australia, we provide school bags, school supply kits to our children to assist them in the learning pathway. You know, these bags are bulging with pens, pencils, rubbers, erasers, whatever's necessary. But let's take it back and ask more fundamental questions. What is a school bag? Why do you need a school bag? What goes in a school bag? Where do you get a school bag from? By asking some of these questions, the endpoint that you end up at is actually quite different. And two of the endpoints that we discovered in our process were actually that there is value in a school bag far beyond its utility. There is value in a school bag as a possession and as a form of self-expression. So we integrated art classes into our distribution strategy so that the kids could personalise the bags, really make them something to be proud of. And second, we discovered that the value provided in the short term in terms of economic stability and confidence to the local area by sourcing the supplies locally was actually as valuable as the provision of the supplies to the kids themselves. So supportive innovation, innovation by increment, will slowly change the status quo. But we should always be encouraging young thinkers to reason from fundamentals, to take that massive risk. So just say you do that. Just say you take that risk, take the leap, you reason from fundamentals, and you create an idea that you don't think anyone's come up with before. How do you know that that idea is even a good one? Or how do you situate yourself in a setting that means you can maximise what you're trying to build? Well, that brings me to my second challenge, embracing vulnerability. The stories that are promulgated through popular culture and startup folklore are those of Zuckerberg, Jobs, Gates. These are lone wolves that have taken, idea, taken an idea and pursued it to success at all costs. Even when vulnerability and failure as concepts are discussed, it's usually in a, a really romanticised fashion. You know, a, cata a catastrophic, cataclysmic failure, followed by a phoenix-like rise from the ashes to inevitable success. The pinnacle example of this is Steve Jobs, his unceremonious removal from Apple, followed by his reinstatement to become the meteoric rise to CEO of a multi-billion dollar empire. We're conditioned to see vulnerability as something that is weak, that is unbecoming of a leader, as something that is unattractive. But the reality is, is that young entrepreneurs are missing an opportunity every day by not showing authentic vulnerability. They're missing an opportunity to be supported, to be challenged, and to build the best enterprise that they possibly can. So today, I offer you proof and validation that vulnerability actually makes you stronger. But before we get to that, a little bit of context. In 2008, as a newly minted bulletproof university student, a law student, naturally, I began my first foray into the entrepreneurship world, building the university social enterprise organisation. I soon moved outside of that university structure and into the not-for-profit space. And as these enterprises were scaling and, and growing, I noticed my mindset begin to shift. It was no longer a question of how many people could I talk to, how many diverse opinions could I get to then reason through to the best solution. It became, well, other people are perceiving me as successful, so therefore, I need to act in a way that I think successful people act. And that's as a lone wolf. I was putting up this shield, and one that resulted in the rapid growth of a number of organisations, but one that restricted my ability to discuss concerns, daily struggles, and even float crazy new ideas. And in 2012, the shield shattered. A series of captain's picks, if you will, overwhelmed one of our teams and resulted in the shutdown and restructure of a key arm of an organisation. Now, boy, did I learn quickly from that. Now, as a technology geek, I've sought to visualise the impact that my changing mindset has had on my personal and professional development. So, this is my communication network, 
mapped mostly from email and social media data. And this is from a number of years ago, around 2011. So each one of these dots, each one of these nodes, is a person I communicate with regularly. I'm here in the center, and you can see that the traffic is relatively one way, relatively linear. It's me sending information out to people and then receiving information back. But let's compare that to the same graph taken earlier this year. Quite a bit different, right? And there are a few things that we can learn immediately from that massive difference. First, the sheer number of people that I'm talking to regularly has increased. The sheer number of opinions I'm getting has dramatically increased since a few years ago. But it's not all white traffic, white noise and increased traffic. You can see here the emergence of a key group of influencers. Now, these influencers are people that not only have a strong record of communication with me, but they've got a very strong record of communication with others in my network as well. These influencers are the people that I go to on a daily basis to discuss concerns, struggles, and yes, float that crazy new idea. These influencers are the people that will support me irrelevant of any perceived success or otherwise. So my second challenge comes from this graph. Find your influencers. And that won't happen through a fake it till you make it approach. It will only happen once you embrace genuine vulnerability. So the final shift I'd like to discuss this evening is that of purpose. There is a tendency for a dichotomy between those entrepreneurs that are commercially successful and those that are socially successful. There's a growing movement of social enterprises, so for-profit commercial companies that have a, you know, a social element to their business plan. But the challenge I'd like to issue today is actually far simpler. For every commercial enterprise that's created, there is a social benefit that can and should be pursued, especially if your enterprise is young. And I issue this challenge based on two factors. First, the next wave of consumers and customers is actually demanding transparency and social responsibility. And second, is that there is nothing more motivating and galvanizing than seeing your invention in action for the benefit of others. So there's multiple examples recently of the new age of transparency. You know, consumers and customers that are demanding social responsibility. Take, for example, the recent campaigns against Nestle for the use of palm oil, against companies for their activities on the Great Barrier Reef, and the pinnacle example against BP for their lackluster response to the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. But this demand, this thirst for social responsibility, actually can be a massive boost for young enterprises. Take, for example, the success of the Thank You Water Group in Australia. By adding a social element to bottled water, they've actually achieved remarkable market penetration in just a few years. For our company, we rolled out our learning management system across South American schools in conjunction with a local NGO. And we built a data management system for education data in Vietnam. These projects were a massive struggle to complete for a fledgling company. But the networks, the knowledge, and definitely the experience that we gained as a result is invaluable. So struggling up that hill in Haiti, and struggling up the many hills, both metaphorical and literal, that have come since, one overarching sentiment has stayed with me. The challenges that we face are indeed great, and our response should not be modest. We want to be the enterprise, the nation, the generation that's known for throwing out the innovation by increment playbook. And as someone that's just beginning their entrepreneurial journey, and as someone who still has an awful lot to learn, I know that it can be excruciatingly daunting to reason from fundamentals, to create a new idea that you don't know whether it's going to work or not. I know that it can be almost paralyzing to embrace genuine vulnerability, to let people know that you care about that idea so much, and to seek brutal feedback on that. And I know it can be a mammoth challenge, particularly for a young enterprise, to think and pursue the social at the same time as the commercial. But if it's possible, and I know it is, then I can't wait to see what you all build next. Thank you.